Welcome to Censored. I'm Aoife Vrednach, excavator and chronicler of vintage smut. Except this time, the banned magazine is still in print. Health and Efficiency celebrates its 120th anniversary this December 2022. It's a British mag, and if you live in Blighty, you can buy it in WH Smith's, which is a high street news agent. But bad news for Irish listeners, it's still illegal to sell it in Ireland. I know, it seems unbelievable and ridiculous, but health and efficiency is still banned. It's still listed on the Register of Prohibited Publications created by the Censorship Acts. Now, I put a link in the show notes to that register so you can download a PDF from the government website of the current blacklist. Of course, it's very funny that this magazine is still an illegal object, but even if I had gotten a recent copy, that wouldn't really help explain why it was banned in February 1933. As you know by now, one of the most important features of the Irish Censorship Board is that they don't have to give any reasons for any of their decisions to anyone. Now, I did check the original register, the big book in the office in Dublin, to find out. In that original, there are notes in pencil made by civil servants, scribbles in the margin that record the legal underpinnings for bans. So they would write that a publication was full of crime or was found to be indecent, in pencil, because, of course, the form didn't actually have a space for the censors to state their reasons. So keeping these notes was an internal housekeeping kind of thing. It wasn't for the eyes of the public. In that PDF blacklist online, those little pencil notes, they just don't make it into it. But those marginal comments by long-dead civil servants recorded that health and efficiency was banned for birth control reasons. I thought fair enough, until I googled health and efficiency and saw images of its front cover from the 1930s. Naked people, fully buck naked people were on the cover. Of course, I knew then this magazine had to have an episode, but there were no copies of it in any library on the island of Ireland, because it wasn't imported, so it couldn't even be collected. To my disgust, I couldn't find any back issues online either. But fortunately, I found someone who has read many issues of Health and Efficiency and has even written a book featuring the magazine. Professor Annabella Pollan of the University of Brighton has written Nudism in a Cold Climate about the history of the movement and especially its photographic image. Who better to explain what the magazine was like and what the photographs in the magazine were like in the 1930s when the Irish censor banned it? Hi, Annabella. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me to discuss health and efficiency. Thank you very much for having me. Really excited to be on your podcast and to be talking to you about one of my most favourites and the most fascinating of magazines. It's certainly an unusual one. When I go through the list and I Google the titles, I'm always looking for something interesting. And this one really jumped out at me. So could you maybe just take me through the general content of the magazine first? From the edited highlights you kindly shared with me, I saw a lot of vegetarianism, which was interesting. But the big theme that jumped out was sunbathing. And this kind of surprised me a little. Why is sunbathing such an important part of the magazine? Yeah, well, health and efficiency, you wouldn't know from its title that it had anything to do with sunbathing as an interest, and indeed that it had anything to do with nudism or naturism, as its practitioners prefer to call it. It's not entirely clear what the title even means and and what such a magazine entails. Uh, The health bit is a bit more self-explanatory, but um, even then, what is covered in a health magazine in the early years of the 20th century is quite different to what might be covered in a health magazine that you might buy in the 2020s. So um, Health and Efficiency magazine started in around 1900, but the issues that I shared with you and the decade that's kind of most pertinent to what you're interested in is the uh, 1920s. And in the 1920s, the magazine was concerned with health and fitness but not in a very conventional way it was interested in kind of new health as they called it and new slightly experimental treatments and its readers were not 
people who were just happy to go to the doctors and pop a pill. They wanted to take health matters into their own hands. So they were often outdoor enthusiasts who believed in the sort of invigorating power of fresh air. They were hikers and campers. They often believed in food reform, so diet, new approaches to diet, which included vegetarian and fruitarian diets and more food diets. Those were a real staple of discussion in the magazines. But as part of kind of exercising um, and as part of taking fresh air, new ideas about the benefits of sunlight on the skin were being discussed and how sunlight could be used as a cure and a treatment because many of the cures and treatments that were discussed in the magazine were natural. So they were using things like water and mud and magnetism even, um, and especially sunlight. So sunlight was seen as a really beneficial health cure. And the more of your body you could expose to the light, the better. It was seen to have all sorts of positive effects and not just vitamin D. It was also seen to have kind of psychological effects, including the freedom from shame. So kind of psychological health benefits that were seen to be part of what was kind of bogging the nation down. So yeah, it became a really, really central part of what the magazine was interested in in the 20s. And as it went into the early 1930s, it completely went over to being a nudist magazine. And in fact, it still exists today. So since the very early 1930s to the present day, its principal interest, its main interest is nudism or naturism. So the exposing of the whole naked body to sunlight, or in fact, not even sunlight, because you can do nudism indoors as well. But it grew out of those interests of the 20s. That's just fascinating, the idea that, you know, taking your clothes off wasn't just to expose your skin to sunlight for physical reasons, but to shed some social stigma and anxiety. That's really intriguing way of thinking about it, isn't it? Yeah, and it was a seen as a kind of holistic practice. I'm not sure that those terms were necessarily used at the time, but um, in terms of the sort of remit of health inefficiency, it covered all matters psychological, and there was a lot of coverage of sort of new psychology theories, so Freud, broadly speaking, um, and this idea that as a nation, because it was always a very British nationalistic address going on in health and efficiency it wasn't just about making individuals healthy it was about making a healthy nation that was all to do with making people physically fit but also kind of liberating minds and you know expanding consciousness as well so these are terms that were not exactly those that were used at the time but a sort of psychological liberation and new ways of thinking were definitely part of the mix I thought it felt very utopian and, you know, hugely optimistic um, when I read it. Just the bits that you sent to me, they're so overflowing with excitement for these these new theories. But the word efficiency, I also kind of kept coming across and it kept snagging me because to me, it suggests that the body is like a machine and that it can be tweaked or just adjusted slightly before it runs at full capacity. And I found there was something about that that made me uneasy, even though the tone is so optimistic and so hopeful. Am I kind of overreacting to efficiency, the word there as a concept? You no, know, I think you're right. It's a very curious term. It's one that doesn't seem to fit naturally with health. It might be health and fitness might go together, but health and efficiency, it's a strange pairing of terms. So I think it has to be understood in the context of the period when there were a lot of national anxieties about the national body being this rather soggy, podgy, weak and unfit sort of mass of poorly fed, perhaps even malnourished people with um, you know, poor dental hygiene, poor physical fitness. Some of that has um, particularly come to light um, around the um, assessment of bodies for military fitness around the First World War, but it predated that too. So a kind of general worry that the nation was sluggish and moving slowly and with kind of new discipline and with new forms of systematic exercise, new kinds of self-control, regimes of self-control, this kind of podgy 
barrel-chested, pasty-faced kind of Britain could be made into this golden, glorious, muscular, sort of godlike body. So I think the this idea about the um, the sort of body as machine is definitely there running through it. And it's a little bit of a contradiction. It doesn't sit too easily with some of these rather fluffy, I suppose, ideas about natural health and the natural health cure, which might seem to be opposite or opposing a kind of machine or mechanistic way of thinking. But yeah, this idea that people needed a systematic training and that these new kind of health regimes could provide it was definitely there. What those health regimes might be was actually, they were many and various. It might include collective gymnastics. It might include tango dancing. It might include kind of bodybuilding with weights, but it might also include yoga. So there were lots of different experimental exercise regimes proposed and different sort of dietary um, regimes proposed. And they were much discussed in the pages of the magazine. And I think when you say it's quite optimistic, there are parts of it that are utopian. So this idea of sort of making this kind of new world of healthy and godlike figures is there. But there are also really unpleasant aspects to it that are not utopian in the slightest. And some of those would include a rather elitist idea about who had the right to be fit and the difference between the fit and the unfit and whether fitness is something that should be available to all or whether there are some people who are just wasters and are dragging the rest of the nation down. There's a lot of eugenic thinking in those years in the magazine, in health cultures generally at the time, lots of eugenic ideas about the fit and the unfit, lots of terrible ideas about disability, you know, racist, classist ideas that run through the magazine. So while it does have this kind of evangelical tenor and even a sort of utopian kind of tenor, some of those ideas are underpinned by really discriminatory thinking that's really, really unpalatable to our 21st century ears. Well, it's true that it's interesting that there's so much there that, you know, does ring true today with, you know, tango dancing and yoga and weights. And, you know, there's a lot of those themes are continuing in health and fitness today. And then all of the, that tension there with the unfit and the eugenic ideas. It's really quite a really interesting mix in that way. Uh, and is it possible, you know, to assess how popular this magazine was? I know that within the pages, you know, that the editors are saying it's amazing, everyone's buying it, sign up now. But I don't automatically believe that sort of internal propaganda. Was it widely circulated and could you just walk into a normal um, news agents and just pick it up? Yeah, it's a really good question. It was sold through newsstands. It was a mainstream publication in that sense. You know, one could subscribe to it, but equally you could buy it at a train station. You could buy it from... WH Smith's or any kind of news agent, news vendor. How popular it was is harder to say. I think the kind of population that it was communicating with, who might have even seen themselves as a movement, a kind of new health movement, I think it is quite a niche group. So there was a lot of discussion of vegetarianism in the pages of the 1920s magazines. And I think that was something that was you know, some people took up enthusiastically, but it was not a mass practice at all. And some of the propositions for new experimental health treatments ran against the grain of what was being proposed on a national level. So sometimes there were people who wrote in the pages who were anti-vaccination and they were opposed to these vaccination programs that were being brought in on a sort of national health level. And I think the population of readers was also one who was quite well educated. You needed to know something about biology, something about psychology to kind of understand the context. And some of the writers for the magazine were the same authors who were producing book length publications. They might be psychiatrists or physicians or educationalists. So there was quite an elite readership. So it wasn't a mainstream I mean, it wasn't a mass publication, but it was something that could be bought in a mainstream way. As for numbers, it's hard to say how many people bought it. I'd say perhaps it 
circulated in the tens of thousands in the 1920s. That's me kind of pitching a guess. Um, but it's slightly informed by some numbers that I do have from the 1930s. So when Health and Efficiency magazine turned over to being entirely devoted to nudist matters and featured nude bodies on the cover, particularly young, beautiful, slim white women, solo or in groups, these kind of Venus-type figures in very stylized photographs. And when every single page had naked bodies on, often in heroic poses, often these kinds of god and goddess-like figures, when it turns into a fully nudist magazine, I think that was definitely a commercial decision. And throughout the 30s, in Britain, when nudism was becoming more acceptable and even fashionable, there was a boom in nudist magazines and health and efficiency was definitely one of the most popular. It was one of the most commercial, lots of adverts in it. It was one that was attempting to speak to a broader audience than some of the others, which were even more intellectual. And um, I know that some of those other magazines were boasting readerships of 50,000, 100,000. So when it gets into the 1930s, it really is booming. And a lot of those people, let's say, are not buying it for the article about yoga or meditation or even things to do with varicose veins or boils or any of the other things that were discussed as health matters in the pages. They're buying it for these very, very idealised, very attractive naked bodies, which, you know, it, it becomes one of the few places, the naturist magazine or the nudist magazine becomes one of the few places where you can buy naked bodies in a public way, you know, over the counter because it's kind of, it's got this nudist philosophy. It enabled people to consume the nude body in photographs in ways that just weren't possible anywhere else. So that was obviously quite a canny decision for selling copies of Health and Efficiency. I just find that so interesting that as it turns to nudism, in Britain, as a commercial decision uh, to sell more copies, that is when the Irish definitively ban it forever and are like, no way, no scantily clad ladies and, you know, naked ladies on on magazines in this country. <laughs> yeah. And maybe men too, because although men and women were pictured in the beginning, it, women did dominate, but there were also very tightly flexed, well-oiled, muscular men who were either completely naked if pictured from behind or wearing just a very skimpy kind of loincloth or some kind of jock strap or g-string so yeah um no men and no women for the for the irish censor yeah i found that really interesting that because 1929 there's a mixture of matters discussed in health and efficiency camping and hiking birth control and vaccination, vegetarian diet, sunbathing. There's a whole range of different things in there. But by 1933, by the time that you point out that it's completely banned in Ireland, it would have been then wholly as a nudist magazine. So, yeah, it is something that was perceived by quite a lot of people as quite scandalous. Um, lots of people who weren't fans of nudism thought it was one step away from being a public orgy they thought it was something that was going to corrupt modern morals and there were quite a lot of people who um thought nudism was just a joke something kind of funny to snicker about and there were much smaller people a group of people who were enthusiasts but i think among the skeptics there were many people who thought it was questionable and just a kind of ruse to enable the circulation of you know, sexual imagery. So, yeah, I don't think Ireland was alone in its scepticism about nudism, but to go as far as to ban it, that never happened in Britain. It was it was received and discussed in sceptical ways, but never, never the subject of a ban. And the Irish claimed formally in the, the register that they were banning it because of birth control propaganda, as they called it. Was this the advertising within it, do you think, or was it the features? Because sometimes a magazine's ads are very different to the features. You know, they're two separate things when you read these old magazines. So what do you think it was? There was some discussion about birth control in the articles and in the editorial. There was definitely a sense that 
the general population didn't know enough about how babies were made, didn't know enough about how to control the size of the family. Some of those ideas, again, were informed by eugenic ideas and some of them very classist, very racist. The idea that, you know, white, middle and upper class families weren't having many children while working class families and so-called foreigners were, you know, multiplying wantonly, as the magazine would have put it. So some of that information about birth control was in order to kind of perpetuate some eugenic ideology. And it wasn't always put in the most straightforward of terms. There was still quite a lot of euphemism about sex in the magazine. We are still talking about the 1920s when you know, polite society found it quite hard to discuss these things. So there was still quite a lot of euphemism about what it was that was actually being taught. But um, yeah, being conscious and knowledgeable about contraception and fertility cycles and things like that, that was absolutely part of the editorial of the magazine. And the books that were advertised for sale in the back pages were the books that were discussed in the book review section as well. So although there can be a tension, as you note, between what's sold in the back pages and what's discussed in the main pages, there was in in the instance of birth control, there was quite a bit of traffic in the discussion. So I'd say that in general, the people who were writing for um, health and efficiency and the kinds of audiences that they were speaking to were those in favour of sex education and birth control promotion. So I think the Irish state is right to call it a form of propaganda because it was being promoted as a form of kind of knowledge and understanding that the British population was meant to have, according to the to the authors of Health and Efficiency. Yes, there's a fine line between advertising and propaganda. And sometimes that's just your ideology is where you draw the line, I think. Yeah, having said that, the adverts for health and efficiency are really, really fascinating because they are the kinds of adverts that are only possible before there's an advertising standards agency in place. So the kinds of claims of some of the products are really, really nutty. You know, be taller is one of them. That always really tickles me. Just this instruction, be taller. And you can take a pill and you can do certain exercises and you can buy devices that will strap your ears back, shorten your nose, raise your height, slim you down, fatten you up, make you more muscular, make you more attractive to the opposite sex, make your hair grow back. When you look at the the sort of composite picture of who is spoken to by this ad, by these adverts, it's usually a middle-aged man whose energy is flagging, his hair has fallen out, whose stomach's become a bit podgy, who's generally needing a bit of kind of pick-me-up. There's a lot of adverts for potions called things like Vim and Figo and Vital Tonic, and they're obviously the sort of Viagra of their day, so they're, they're sort of addressing this kind of, you know, balding, ageing, middle-aged spread impotent figure who's quite the opposite of the person depicted in the photographs who's this Adonis-like Greek god-like young muscular hero so um, yeah it's kind of like you look through the pages of health inefficiency you kind of see what you ought to be like and then you get to the back pages and you buy the products and the devices and the services that might help you get there. It sounds like the people who were sceptical of uh, the appeal of the magazine might have had a point then that, you know, it was being sold to people who were uh, enjoying looking at other people's bodies rather than rejoicing in the perfection of their own. Yeah, yeah. And also the kinds of books that were being sold, often under the title of, you know, booksellers calling themselves vital books and, you know, sort of educational kind of providers of text, they often had... Um, some texts that were sort of serious works of psychology, serious works of sexology, but they also had a lot of other titles that looked rather suspect, like A History of the Rod, you know, some kind of books that might be more for one's reading pleasure than one's kind of, um, you know, education. So nudism had that kind of double aspect as well, where it had quite a high-minded 
side, which was about the theory of light and the sun's rays, it had the psychologist and the psychiatrist who promoted its beneficial tendencies for body and mind. But it also had, of course, this salacious aspect. It had this kind of sexual aspect. And um, early nudists or naturists were really, really keen to separate out the naked body from sex. And they made the point really strongly all the time that nudism had nothing to do with sex. But um, you do find that kind of slipping. And I think there were quite a lot of people who did think that naked bodies, especially attractive photographs of attractive naked bodies, were to do with sex. And indeed, the the adverts for the bookshop sometimes has sex. The sex of sexology written in extra large text, written in kind of bold lettering so i think they were kind of playing with that um with that tension which is look we're a respectable bookseller but you know you can come here and you can buy your you can buy your text about yes a history of punishment a history of the phallus around the world and some of these things that were i think a bit of a a cover for other kinds of pleasures and interests I think I've actually come across the History of Punishment books before in my research, and I'm fairly sure they did eventually get banned as well. Even though they are technically non-fiction serious history books, there was a fine line there, I think. Yeah, and in fact, although I've said that Health and Efficiency magazine wasn't banned, there were um, obscenity cases against publishers and against suppliers of books, not just those who published those kinds of books, but those who supplied them as well. And, you know, you had kind of books of sexology and books about nudism getting mixed up in those kinds of cases because a sort of pollution happens when um, there's an obscenity case. And if there's a mixture of sort of sexual content being sold alongside non-sexual content, everything will get tainted. So from the 1930s through to the 1960s, there were cases where nudist material got caught up in um, you know, court cases and censorship cases where books were seized, especially in the 50s and 60s, books were seized, books were destroyed. But um, yeah, there was never a sort of outright ban in Britain on the magazine itself, but it got mixed up in some of those cultures of banning and destruction. And one of the most extraordinary things about health and efficiency is that it's still banned here in Ireland. And you've actually written for it recently. So how does it feel to have contributed to a publication that's on a government blacklist? You're in a select club. Yeah. (laughs) I hadn't really thought about that until you pointed it out to me. And it does really tickle me, actually, because, you know, when you spend a long time looking through the pages of these kinds of magazines, health and efficiency was just one source that I used, but it was a really central source that I used when I was writing my book about the history of nudism and the history of nude photography, I used it really, really centrally. And in fact, I have to say, I'm really grateful to the current publishers of the magazine for giving me permission to use so much of the material from their back issues and for sharing it with me. So, but yeah, when it came to being invited to write about my book um, in the very pages of the magazine that I had been researching, it felt really neatly circular. And I was really pleased to do it because um, I felt like I'd got so much from the study of the magazine, I wanted to give something back. And in fact, the article that I wrote, which was in the April 2022 edition, I actually wrote it about censorship because when I tried to access some of the literature about nudism and that included, you know, magazines that were produced by naturists and... um, books that were produced by naturists if you want to look at them in the British Library you have to go to the rare books section and you have to go to a special desk in the rare book section and you have to take the books that you want to borrow and put them in front of a special kind of monitor all this felt really archaic and you have to show this special monitor the books that you're looking at she has to approve that you can look at them And then you have to sit on a special table in front of an area that is overseen. Um, And the the woman who is the sort of approver or disapprover seemed to sit on a kind of slightly higher chair on a platform. It reminds me of um, the lifeguard at a swimming pool or the umpire in tennis match. She was sort of elevated. She was looking over everyone who had books 
which are from this kind of marked section that you need approval, I had to take a big sheet of bookmarks. Each one said no photography. I understand when I look at these books that no photography is allowed. And the table that I sat on had a special section saying, you know, any book looked at in this section, no photography is permitted. And I did say to her, I'm actually writing a book about naked photographs, so I'm asking to look at books of naked photographs. And I'd like to take photographs just for study purposes of the photographs in these books. And it involved such a circuitous conversation about whether or not that was permitted. I really did feel like I was sat at what some researchers have called the naughty table. And it really struck me as being something that was really archaic and in fact some of the other literature that I'd been looking at so researchers before me for example as um Peter Fryer in the 1960s wrote a book called Mrs Grundy about British attitudes to I think he called it crude uh crudery so um he was talking about British attitudes to sex historically he said that he had the same problem he tried to access books about sex books that had naked bodies in them and he found that he was restricted he was doing it then in the British Library as part of the British Museum and the British Museum reading room did not permit any old person to leaf through these books they thought that people were coming for erotic purposes and it was really hard to look at them and even way before that in the Edwardian period when um, Edward Carpenter and other sex sexologists tried to access material they found it hard to get access so i found it really ridiculous that in 20 in the 2020s you still can't look at this stuff without somebody sort of watching over you so i ended up writing about that for health and efficiency magazine and wondering whether my own book would then in turn end up on the naughty table and that people would have to ask to view it and only if they were kind of deemed you know sufficiently intellectual enough would they be allowed to access it so it's interesting that you're adding to that kind of story of censorship with your perspective from Ireland, which I really didn't know anything about at all. So it's very illuminating. You've given me an ambition to go to the British Library and sit in the naughty section now. That is such a wonderful story of being surveyed and scrutinised in reading books that are really quite old and that, you know, Really, if you put them out in front of a normal person, they wouldn't consider them scandalous at all. But it sounds just hilarious. Yeah, I mean, especially because in the period that I was looking at, so Health and Efficiency magazine and other kind of naturist publications from the 1920s through to about 1970, they had really restrictive laws in Britain about what body parts could be shown and how. And so they're actually really, really tame by present day standards because um, there were rules about not showing genitalia so men and women had to have their genitals either screened so the photograph might cut off just before it gets to the groin area or there might be some prop like a beach ball or a strategically positioned basket or a garden fence or something that conceals the genital area or if that was not possible a limb might be raised or you know the sort of stylized arrangement of body parts to conceal it and if that was not possible photographers and publishers had to scrape out the offending part so no pubic hair could be shown no genitals could be shown and they were kind of scraped off the negative so you have this kind of weird empty space in the photograph where somebody's groin used to be there's just a kind of clouded area so this idea that anyone was going to get any erotic thrill from looking at these (laughs) really tickled me obviously there are exposed buttocks and there are exposed breasts but if you're going for pornographic purposes they would be quite frustrating they're not um explicit by our standards now by any means no, certainly not. But I mean, I did notice the um, the clouded genital areas when I was looking at the images you shared. And I was like, they're airbrushing those. So it's wonderful to hear that they actually did take away from the negative that body part. Yeah, it was sort of airbrushing, you know, with a slightly more rudimentary technology. But it was, yeah, it was scraping away anything that might um, sexually entice 
Yeah, it seems quite ridiculous now, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Oh, well, thank you so much, Annabella. That was so interesting about the types of images that were used and the text and the relationship between the text and the advertising. It's just been fascinating. Thank you for shedding so much light on health and efficiency. My pleasure. Thank you for teaching me something new about it that I didn't already know. Thanks very much. I'll admit that getting naked outdoors doesn't seem very Christmassy to me, but maybe all that talk of sunbathing will warm us up in this chilly winter. Since Christmas is all about children, the next episode will feature a children's book that was banned in 1990. I know 1990 was practically yesterday for some of us. Till then, keep your hands clean and your minds filthy. <laughs>